We are following breaking news right now. Israel launching a large-scale operation in the West Bank that the military says is aimed at targeting terrorists. The Israel Defense Forces conducting the operation alongside the Israel Security Agency and Israel Border Police. The Israeli military saying it killed at least five armed terrorists amid the operation, taking others into custody. And the IDF adding it found weapons, ammo and military equipment and dismantled explosives that were planted under the roads. The Hamas-run Palestinian Health Ministry claiming at least nine people were killed, though it's important to note that they do not distinguish between military and civilian deaths. Do want to bring in Avi Melamed, a former Israeli intelligence official and the founder of Inside the Middle East, to talk a little bit more about all of this. Avi, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here and provide your expertise. We appreciate it. Sure. Thank you for having me. Of course. Well, first off, I do want to talk about this large scale operation that is now underway in the West Bank. What do you make of all of it? And is any of it surprising to see this all play out? Well, there is a bigger drama than that specific story that is dramatic for itself. The bigger drama here is that we have to understand the context. Iran is trying to destabilize the situation in Jordan as part of the Iranian master plan to surround Israel with what we call the Ring of Fire. Jordan has the longest border with Israel, some 350 miles long border, and it basically rubs shoulders with the West Bank, which part of it is under the control of the Palestinian Authority, the major rival of, of, of Hamas. The Iranians are trying to smuggle weapons, narcotics. They are doing that. They are smuggling from, north, from South Syria to Jordan. And from Jordan, they are smuggling to the West Bank. And their purpose is basically to turn the West Bank into Gaza style under Hamas number two. This is the big story that we have to understand that is unfolding in front of our eyes. And Israel, of course, is determined to avoid it. Is it likely that the situation there in the West Bank does escalate even further from here? We keep calling it a large scale operation and you're explaining a little bit more about it. But is it likely that we see this continue over the next uh, few days, weeks, months? The answer is yes. As long as the Iranians and Hamas will be able to continue and to try to stream the West Bank, to flood the West Bank with weapons coming from Jordan, among other places, obviously we should expect the, the continuation and even the escalation of the situation. Right now, in different parts of the West Bank that are under the control of the Palestinian Authority, there are actually locally based Palestinian militias some of them are affiliated with Hamas, some of them are affiliated with the Islamic Jihad, some of them are sort of like independent, quote unquote. The common denominator is that they are all basically vote to fight Israel violently, and of course they are all supported by the Iranians, Hamas, and Islamic Jihad. So we definitely should expect the continuation of instability and unrest in the West Bank as long as the Iranians and Hamas are able to continue and to try to destabilize the situation. And by the way, the Jordanians are well aware of that, and the Jordanians are making a lot of effort also to block the Iranian threat. And there are some other headlines that are coming out of the Middle East that I do want to talk about here, Avi. That's why I'm glad that we have you, because you do have that expertise in Israeli intelligence. I want to talk about the rescue of the hostage that took place yesterday. Obviously, good news, as he is in good health there. My question for you, does that provide any sort of, I guess, idea that it's possible that maybe the IDF and other agencies there know where some of the other hostages could be? The moment you're operating on the ground, and particularly under such uh, circumstances when we talk about Gaza Strip, uh, what happened is that you got a lot of frictions with the locals, and that friction basically results in a lot of information. Some of that information is processed into operational intelligence, and we saw a couple of cases where hostages were released, uh, either dead or alive. Yesterday's um, um, uh, rescue was actually unique in the sense that the person was rescued alive from a tunnel where basically, according to the reports, he was left alone and abandoned by its, uh, by its uh, guards. So definitely, I mean, the more Israel has this friction on the ground, the more information comes in, the more 
the ability or the odds to carry out such uh, rescue missions. Yet we have to remember, Israel still have 108 hostages held in Gaza Strip. I don't think it's realistically to expect that they all will be released in a, in a military operation. We do know that the transportation minister there over in Israel has kind of come under fire for revealing the exact location of uh, that actual operation where the hostage was rescued from that tunnel. Why is it so important to keep that private even after the operation is over? There are many reasons involved. One issue is not to disclose sources of information. Or another issue is to gain the time and the momentum where your rivalry doesn't really know what you hold in your possession, what's the cards of intelligence you hold in your possession. And that gap gives you the advantage to move on and to gain momentum, use the momentum maybe to achieve another achievements. The other thing is a golden rule in the context of counter-terror and intelligence generally, always try to keep your rivalry, um, your rival in, in the dark let him never know what exactly you have in your position. And basically, these are some of the major reasons in the end of the day why the Israeli intelligence and military um, agencies basically are doing a lot of efforts to conceal as much as possible pieces of information that should not be shared out publicly. It's not to say that things would not be shared. Some things should be and can be shared. Some things should not. And it's unfortunate that sometimes for political calculations or whatever the reason, some people actually fail to understand it. Let's talk a little bit more about the ceasefire talks, the hostage release talks in general, as those have been going on now for months upon months. But we do know that we saw uh, those actual talks last week. They were in Doha, then they moved over to Cairo. And now my understanding is that they're back in Doha. Do we know why they are switching cities, switching locations here so frequently? Is there a reason behind it? Well, this poll is kind of like moving from court to court. You got Egypt, you got Qatar, uh, you got all kind of like um, intermediators, sort of speaking, involved in that story. I don't know to say necessarily if changing the location per se indicates uh, some specific or uh, special meaning, but I do think that roughly speaking, when you look at this game playing going back and forth between Egypt and Qatar, you could see that these are two major players that in the end of the day have a very significant role in the context of what's going on in Gaza Strip. And in that regard, I would mention something else that kind of like went under the radar for the last couple of weeks, but it's interesting for itself. Turkey, Erdogan, that always used to play the Palestinian card and particularly the Gaza card in order to harvest political dividends, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, was on the sideline. And then a couple of weeks ago, it kind of like um, sent a signal when the, the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, about two weeks ago, to the best of my recollection, was speaking at the Turkish parliament and actually making a statement saying that he is planning to come with all the Palestinian leadership to, to, to Gaza Street. The fact that he was doing that statement in Turkey is very interesting because it's definitely some sort of a Turkish signal to Hamas. I don't think that Hamas was clearly happy, let's put it this way, with this Turkish gesture. But in the end of the day, that's part of Turkish play. So when you look at the different arenas, so to speaking, Egypt, Qatar, Turkey, and maybe others beyond the scene, you will not be surprised to see from time to time how the ball, so to speaking, is moving from one place to another. And let's also talk about the White House making comments here that they still believe that an attack by Iran on Israel, a direct attack in retaliation, so to speak, for the death of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh is imminent and could happen really at any time. We also know that days ago over the weekend, Hezbollah planned to launch a major attack on Israel, but Israel was able to foil it. So does it appear that what Israel was able to do against Hezbollah could maybe deter her, Iran, from conducting that direct attack? Well, let's put it this way. The Iranian clearly uh, saw what happened on Sunday when Israel, as you said, foiled the planned uh, Hezbollah attack on Israel. Uh, the, the, the accuracy of the intelligence and the professional e execution of this Israeli interception, this preemptive strike, 
basically did not skip the, the eyes of the Iranians. Look, in a couple of minutes, uh, uh, reportedly some 100 Israeli jets basically diminished capacities that Hezbollah was building for years, roughly speaking, in parts of South Lebanon, in large parts of South Lebanon. This is something that the Iranians definitely should not ignore. I remind us all that following the Iranian direct attack on Israel on April 14, there was an Israeli sort of like symbolic retaliation, but it was enough for itself to send the Iranian regime a very strong signal that Israel could cause a significant, severe damage to the Iranian regime in Iran. Now, we all know that the Iranian regime, time and again, vows to threat the, to, to revenge the killing of Ismail Haniyeh, the leader of Hamas uh, that was um, assassinated uh, in Tehran, an and, and, and action or operation attributed to Israel. So we definitely should take this into consideration as well. The issue is that in the end of the day, I, when I'm trying to look from an Iranian perspective, I don't necessarily think that there is, from their perspective, a need to rush and directly hit Israel taking into consideration first the Israeli capacities and the fact that the American forces are deployed across the Middle East in an unprecedented military capacity. The Iranians have a lot of tools in their toolbox that they could apply and use, just the same as a reminder. This is a sophisticated regime. This is a very cynical regime. Is gladly This regime gladly sacrifices anybody else on this planet other than the regime itself. And this is a marathon runner. They could definitely plan ahead for a long period of time, looking for the right time to strike. Don't know to say necessarily directly attacking Israel, but we should definitely always, when it comes to the Iranian regime, should bear this in mind. My last question here before I let you go. We know that Prime Minister Netanyahu has essentially asked for increased security for his son who lives in Florida, uh, really just out of concern that he could be attacked by Iran. So my question really here is, would Iran dare to attack someone on U.S. soil, or could that eventually lead to a larger scale situation if that were to happen? Well, as a fact, Iran attacked or tried to attack on Iranian soil. I want to remind you there has been more than one uh, cases where Iranians were trying to conduct a terror plot on U.S. soil. Um, one of them is involving, involving former uh, U.S. national, uh, national uh, security, John Bolton. So we should remember that and, and bury that in our mind. As for the specific issue regarding Netanyahu's son, I really, of course, don't know what to say. Uh, I guess this is something that is taken uh, in consideration by the Israeli intelligence agencies, because one of the scenarios that is uh, calculated, and I would say quite seriously, within Israeli agencies and security establishment, is that maybe one of the forms or the form of Iranian revenge, quote unquote, on Israel, will be in the form of trying to assassinate or to kidnap some uh, significant uh, Israeli personality uh, on, on a military level or an intelligence level. I don't think that Mr. Netanyahu's son is, um, belongs to either one of those categories. All right. Avi Melamed, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and break it all down. Anything else you want to add about any of this before I let you go? Well, one thing that I would like to add in the context of the possible uh, Israeli-Hamas negotiations, possible deal, we should put a, we should know that there is a linkage between that story and the story of the Iranian slash Hezbollah retaliation. One of the things that was very clear from the beginning was that though they wanted to revenge, as they say, they also face a very significant dilemma we talked about in different in previous uh, sessions and conversations and articles that I wrote. And indeed, the dilemma is still valid. Now, in a way, ironically speaking, I would say that Hamas is holding today the Iranians and Hezbollah hostages. It is ironic because Iran is the major sponsor of Hamas and Hezbollah is Hamas mentor. It's Hamas older brother, so sort to of speaking. They are all part of this axis of resistance. Ironically speaking, Hamas is holding them, so sort of speaking, hostages when it is kind of like still put the negotiations on a freeze or refuses to move forward to some sort of an agreement. Why is it holding them hostages? Because 
Hezbollah's leaders, Nasrallah, and at some point later on, the Iranian himself, basically says once there is going to be a ceasefire in Gaza Street, Hezbollah will stop the attacks on Israel. This is an Iranian interest in the end of the day to try to have a ceasefire in Gaza to save Hamas rule in Gaza because Hamas is very significant and valuable for the Iranians. So here you've got a very interesting convoluted situation, once again reflecting the very complex convoluted ins and outs uh, geopolitics of the Middle East. All right. Thank you so much again, Avi, for taking the time to join us here and break it all down. We appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me, Josh. Take care.